who else invites me to call him Father? Only a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship the holy God. Come Shore. We'll come back at thirsty for more of the, the Lord. 
church family, real quickly, you've probably heard that Jackson County's recovery plan has laid out what will happen in phase two and in phase three. And those are upcoming phases. They will begin phase two tentatively for June the 1st. That is a tentative date and that is subject to change because a number of criteria have to be made, uh, pardon me, met for that to, to hold true. So. I know you're probably anxious about what does that mean to the church because you've probably seen the numbers that I have. Church groups can meet in, in numbers that are 50% of their attendance figures. So that would be significant for our church family. So you may be thinking, well, what does that mean? Are we going to be meeting on June the 1st and, and all that? Well, I can tell you probably not, but we do have people working on that and helping us plan a safe plan to bring us back here as quickly and as safely as we can. So two things I and the elders would like to ask of you right now. Just be patient with the process. Secondly, be prayerful about this as well. 
And, and I would encourage you just continue to persevere in doing what we're doing. Here's the good news. Here's the best news. The church is healthy. The church is functioning very, very well. God is working in some incredible ways in our congregation and throughout this community. And so we're going to be patient and prayerful as this thing continues. And as soon as we have some updated information, we will be sharing it with you very soon. Thanks so much. Good morning, church. We are really glad that you are here. Um, well, joining us online anyway. Um, thank you for joining us for this uh, virtual worship service. We hope that it is edifying to you. Um, there are still many ways to communicate with the, with the church family, with the leadership um, during this time. You are welcome to leave comments on Facebook. You can contact us through the website. There is a contact us form at eicoc.org. Um, you can call or email the church office. Uh, the phone number is available 816-461-0266 or email pedwards at eicoc.org. Um, so multiple ways to continue to stay in touch with, with the church. Um, we do have a call-in number option available uh, for, for this service. So if you know somebody that's having a difficult time connecting online, um, feel free to go to our website, get the information, um, and let them call in so they'll be able to hear all the audio of the service. Um, you can obviously direct them to live stream page at eicoc.org slash streaming as well. Communion supplies, if you'd like to continue taking communion with your family in your home, um, the communion supplies are available every week at the building. You can pick up Saturday mornings from, or Saturday afternoons from noon to 2 p.m. You can also grab a bulletin at that time. Uh, they will be in the racks at the church building during that time on Saturdays. You can also have the bulletin emailed to you. There is a lot of detail in there that um, such as prayer requests that we don't share online due to privacy. You can access that information um, by either by contacting the church office and getting added to the email, and they'll email those to you. Um, there are a few things that we want everyone to be aware of um, due to the recent health crisis. The youth committee has uh, will not be promoting church camps and will not be offering camp scholarships for this summer. Um, we want to let families make their own choices with less outside influence. So we look forward to resuming normal teen activities and uh, we'll keep everyone posted on any changes. Also due to the health crisis and the restrictions placed on gatherings, the difficult decision has been made to cancel Vacation Bible School this year. It is uncertain when the restrictions will be lifted and the Number one concern is the safety of our kiddos. So if you have any questions, please contact Amy Garlett. We do have a note from the deacons. Uh, as you are aware, we have started phase one, opening up the church building. We are adhering to what the, country, the county and city have mandated, which is that groups of no more than 10 can meet at the building at one time. We are also asking that the below guidelines be followed. You must contact the church office before scheduling an event at the building. We do ask that you practice social distancing. You are encouraged to wear face coverings such as masks or scarves, and you will be expected to sanitize all areas that are used, including bathrooms, um, the entry area, tables, door handles, etc. The church will supply the products to do that cleaning. If you have any questions, please contact one of the deacons. Um, another impact on the church during this time is offerings. Um, so, um, you know, do be aware that there are ways that you can continue your uh, you can continue your contributions. Um, you can use. Um, we will have a couple of options here um, on slides. So, one is you can set up a recurring online bill pay arrangement through your bank's website. 
Um, you can mail a check to the church building and the, the website address is eicoc.org slash online giving um, or in the member area online giving. Uh, you can use the mobile app as well. Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this time that we can gather together um, in a virtual environment, that we are one in spirit, that um, we are able to pull our families together and show our children the importance of, of worship even in a, um, a non-routine situation. Lord, we ask that you're with those that are, that are um, struggling in particular with loneliness or with illness um, that that you bring them comfort either by sending a good Samaritan their way um, or by just putting your own hand on them. Lord, we, we ask that you are with this country, that you give us patience for our leaders, that, that we as Christians will extend grace to our, to our, to our friends and to our leaders within this that are trying to get through unprecedented times. Lord, I ask that you will use us as, as a major light in this community. In Jesus' name, amen. Revelations 4, 8. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come.
Praise 
You've probably heard the word holy before, or at least sang it in a church song once or twice. And for most people, this idea is really just connected to being a morally good person. So God is holy because he's morally perfect. Yeah, that is part of it. But in the Bible, the idea of holiness is even bigger and more rich. What it's really describing is how God is the creative force behind the whole universe. He's the one and only being with the power to make a world full of such beauty and life. And so all these abilities, they make God utterly unique, which is the meaning of the word holy. So a helpful way to think about God's holiness is by using the sun as a metaphor. The sun is unique, at least within our solar system, and it's really powerful. It's the source of all this beautiful life on our planet. And so you could say that the sun is holy. And you can actually take this metaphor even further in that the whole area around the sun is also holy. Yeah, because the closer you get to the sun, the more intense it gets. Yeah, exactly. So that very power and goodness that generates all this life is also dangerous. I mean, the sun, if you get too close, will annihilate you. And in the same way, there's this paradox at the heart of God's own holiness, because if you're impure, his presence is dangerous to you. And not because it's bad, but because it's so good. And so the first time we see this paradox of God's holiness, it's in the story of Moses and the burning bush. So God tells Moses to take off his sandals because he's standing on holy ground. And Moses covers his face in fear, and God says, hey, don't come any closer. It's intense. It's actually that intensity of God's holiness that's explored even more in the stories about Israel's temple, which was the main place where God's holy presence was located. And at the center of the temple was this room called the most holy place, this the hot spot of God's presence. And whether you're an Israelite living in the land around the temple or a priest working right in the temple, you're in proximity to God's holy presence, which is dangerous. Yeah, this is a problem. So how's it supposed to work? Well, in the Bible, the solution is that you need to become pure. So like being morally pure. Yeah, and that's easy enough to understand. But the Bible spends a lot of time talking about another kind of purity, being ritually pure, which is a state where you separate yourself from anything related to death, like touching things like diseased skin or dead bodies or even certain bodily fluids. All these make you impure. And becoming ritually impure isn't necessarily sinful. What's wrong is waltzing into God's presence when you're in an impure state. And so that's why God gave the Israelites very clear instructions for knowing when they were impure, steps to become pure, so that they could go into the temple again. So that's what the book of Leviticus is about. Right. But it doesn't stop there. This idea keeps developing. So later in the scriptures, we find this really interesting story by a prophet named Isaiah. And he has this crazy vision where he's in the temple and he's right in God's presence. He's totally terrified. Yeah, he knows the rules. He shouldn't even be in there. And he's worried about being destroyed. And then this crazy creature called a seraphim. Yeah, that is a crazy creature. <laughs> totally. So it flies over with a hot coal, and then it sears Isaiah's lips with the coal and says something really weird. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. So this burning coal somehow makes Isaiah pure. Yeah, it's remarkable because normally if you touch something impure, it transfers its impurity to you. But now here's this new idea where you have this coal, this very holy and pure object, and it touches Isaiah and it transfers its purity to him. Isaiah is not destroyed by God's holiness. He's transformed by it. I mean, the implications of this are just huge. But there's one more development this time from another prophet, Ezekiel. And he has this vision where he's standing at the temple and he sees water trickling out from it. And then that water turns into a stream and then it grows into a deep river that starts flowing through the desert, leaving this trail of green trees behind it. And then it flows into the Dead Sea, making everything fresh and alive. So instead of becoming pure first and then going into the temple, here God's holiness comes out from the temple, making things pure and bringing them to life. What does it all mean? So we don't know until we meet this man, Jesus. And he claims that he's fulfilling all of these ancient visions, but in surprising new ways. So Jesus, he went around touching people who are impure, people with skin diseases, a, a woman with chronic bleeding or dead people. And when he touches them, 
their impurity should transfer over to Jesus, but instead Jesus' purity transfers to them and actually heals their bodies. Jesus is like that holy coal in Isaiah's vision. Right. And Jesus claimed that he was the human embodiment of God's own holiness and that he and his followers were now God's temple so that through them, God's holy presence would go out into the world and bring life and healing and hope. And so this is why Jesus described his followers as having streams of living water flowing out of them. So this is our part of the story where we find ourselves now. but. Where's this all heading? So the last pages of the Bible end with a final vision about God's holiness. And this time it's by a guy named John. And in his vision, we see the whole world made completely new. The entire earth has become God's temple. And Ezekiel's river is there flowing out of God's presence, immersing all of creation, removing all impurity, and bringing everything back to life. Let's pray together for the bread. Father, as we think about Jesus and his holiness, we turn to the bread. Unleavened bread representing his sinless body, a body that never participated in sin and shameful activities many of us do on a daily basis. A body that was denied carnal, earthly pleasures a body that was beaten, stripped naked, and lifted up on the cross for all to see in earthly humiliation. As we all share in this bread, please bring to our minds just how worthy and holy Jesus is. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's pray together for the fruit of the vine. Continuing to remember Jesus' sacrifice, in our minds we turn to the blood that flowed from his body on the cross, represented in the juice that we drink. In the book of Revelation, the question is asked and answered, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scrolls? Referring to Jesus, humanity answered, he's worthy of death. Heaven has a different answer. Again, referring to Jesus, when no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was found, John heard the hosts of heaven singing, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. As we share together in the wine, Lord, please help us understand just how worthy Jesus is to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Revelation 15:4 Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Oh! 
Isaiah 53, 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Good morning, church family. So good to have you along with the ride uh, with us this morning. And speaking of along for the ride, uh, I have decided recently to kind of look into buying this really, really cool classic used car. Don't, don't, don't tell Rita. But I got some pictures of it to show you to see what you think. Okay, so here it is. It's a, a classic car. This is a 1998 Maserati 228. I want you to know there were only this is only one of 500 that were ever made. Two doors coupe, beautiful car. Check out the interior. We got leather interior. Man, look at that leather and wood grain. Beautiful and enough dryer sheets in there to hide the body of a dead frog. Uh, cool car, love the car. You'll also notice low mileage, baby. Look at that. Just over 50,000 miles. What a, what a cool looking car. And here's the, the neat thing. Only seven grand for the asking price. And I know you, you're ready to buy it out from under me, aren't you? I, I can see the little jealous faces all the way from over here. But, but there is one slight issue. It's very little minor detail there in the fine print. Right down there by description, not running. Ooh, needs engine rebuilt. Ooh, zero compression in one cylinder. Great if you live on top of a hill and just want to roll down into town from time to time, but probably not going to be buying the car. Don't need another project. If you do, hit me up and I'll tell you where you can find it. But you know, there's probably nothing I can think of that's more powerless, if you will, than a car without an engine. However, the more I think about it, I can think of one thing that might be as disappointing, maybe even more so, and that would be a Christian trying to live life without the power of the Holy Spirit. We've been talking about the Holy Spirit for the last several weeks. In fact, this is lesson six of a six-lesson mini-series. We're going to wrap things up today. Uh, there's so much for us to talk about on this subject. Uh, we've only scratched the surface. I don't have time today for a lot of introductory material or review because we're trying to get somewhere. So let's move along. Uh, I want us to see, first of all, our title today uh, for this lesson is entitled, Best Intentions to Blessed intentions, the power for living through the Holy Spirit. And our objective to this lesson is to hopefully better understand the power and help that's available to us through the Spirit. So here's a question for you. Can a Christian be without the Holy Spirit? Can we be a Christian? without the power of the Spirit? Well, I will tell you the simple answer to that question is no. But let's read a passage. Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 11 read as follows. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed, watch this, the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, watch this, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. Man, there's power for living and power for righteousness right there. Continue the reading. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. Oh, there's great power in the Spirit for us, is there not? So the first point that I want us to see this morning is this, best intentions. And we've all heard all kinds of lines about best intentions. We've all lived with them in countless ways. But best intentions are failed attempts often to live life by our own power. And knowing what we should do and having good intentions to do what is right does not always guarantee that we'll follow through and do what we know to do that is right. Read with me in your Bibles again, beginning in Romans chapter 7. And here we'll begin reading for, for several verses. Romans 7 begins this way, verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. Sold as a slave to sin. 
I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. You see, the problem isn't the law. The law is spiritual. No, the problem's more personal than that. The problem is me. I am, as this verse says, unspiritual. I am, as this reading said in verse 14, unspiritual or carnal, if you will. Continue the reading. Look at verse 17. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I remember the old comics line, the devil made me do it. Well, I don't know that we're advocating that, but, but one thing Paul is saying to us here is this. Sin is a very powerful internal force in our life. And not only is it powerful, it's evil. It's insidious. It's unspiritual. It's carnal. And our intentions are often driven by that power. Continuing the reading, verse 18 tells us this. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. And why? What, what's the problem here? Our intentions are so good, it's that our nature is so bad. And so we continue the reading yet again, verses 19 through 20. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil that I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Sin as this parasitic presence, if you will, living inside of me, living inside of us, chipping away at our very best intentions, chipping away and, and helping us taste defeat after defeat. When our desire is to do good, and if you've ever been there, then you can relate to what Paul is saying. So my question to you is this, have you ever experienced the same type of failure that Paul's alluding here to? Knowing the right thing to do, but not being able to do it? Knowing what you want to do, but just kind of failing in the execution? Well, unfortunately, of course you have. All, all of us have. In fact, the word all could have six R's. We have all failed at these kinds of things. We all know this very well. So why do these attempts so often happen in our life where we want to do the right thing, but we fail or we fall short? Why is it that that happens to us? Could it be that we're so often trying to live by our own power? Uh, you know, I, I find in me that desire like a small kid. I love this in my grandkids. It, it's kind of funny to me as a grandfather. It wasn't as funny as a dad sometimes. But my grandkids, they tell me all the time, I, I want to do it. I, I want to do it, Papa. Man, we all want to be that kid that, that just wants to do it. We want to have that confidence in ourselves. We want to flex our own muscles. We want to feel like we're powerful enough to have our own agency. I want to do it. Wow, we've heard kids say that countless times. We ourselves, as God's children, have said that to Him, to ourselves, to those around about us. We have that I want to do it complex. And often we want to do things that we're somewhat powerless to do by our own power, by our own agency, by our own influence. I think, secondly, we tend to believe in ourselves <laughs> probably far too much and definitely to our detriment. So I want us to realize that human willpower is a real problem. And it's a real problem for at least two reasons. Number one, it will fail us. And it will fail us about nine times out of four. It will fail us. The second problem is, is that it is of human origin. It lacks divine power. And because of that, it lacks spiritual power. And that's why we find ourselves struggling and being defeated in these spiritual battles. Willpower failed Paul as well. Read with me again Romans chapter 7. Well, we won't read it again, but we'll allude to it. Romans 7, 14 through 20. There we read about Paul's intentions to do what was right. But, but what he wanted to do that was right was the very thing he struggled with. He couldn't do it. 
And the things that he hated, the things that he didn't want to do, the things that he knew were wrong, those were the things that so often popped up in his life and reared their ugly head. We often associate weakness and willpower with failure to successfully do a host of things in our life that we deeply desire to do. But we just can't seem to pull off. I ran across this interesting quote this week and kind of an interesting source. I'll read it to you. This is from uh, uh, Psychology Today, uh, actually December of 2013 issue on intentions. And here's a cool, uh, cool quote. It says, philosophers call cases where people fail to act in their own best interest, watch this, weakness of will. Ah, weakness of will. But the writer goes on to say, but I prefer the more neutral term used by psychologists, intention, action, gaps. Ah, there's that intention, but the actions don't quite line up with it. There's that gap if you will. There's that cognitive dissonance. There's that betrayal of what we want to do to what we actually pull off. goes on to say, clearly, there's a serious gap between how people act and their intentions. To lose weight, to drink less, to work more, and engage in other behaviors that they reflectively view as desirable. We've all been there. goes on to say, the term weakness of will presumes that our minds include a kind of faculty or organ that's responsible for actions that can be weak, like a muscle that is incapable of lifting heavy weights. Such idea about will and its shortcomings fit with everyday views of the mind, but are often incompatible with scientific evidence. And I'll tell you something else they're incompatible with too. They're incompatible with the divine power that God wants coursing through us because of our sinful nature. Back to Romans 7 for just a moment, beginning in verse 21 and reading through the first part of verse 24. Paul says this, So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner to the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Boy, when we look at this, I guarantee you, we can see the emotional power in the failings of Paul. Paul, Paul here is joyfully concurs with the, 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 the God's law. He, he delights in it in his inner being, he says. But sin made him a prisoner, leading him to an exclamation of frustration. What a wretched man I am. The thrill of victory, but the agony of defeat. I think we've all been there. Have you ever felt similar emotions? Of course you have. And if you're like me, you're like most of us, most often we feel emotional power outages immediately following a spiritual failure or a moral collapse. Back to Romans chapter 7, verse 21, the second part of it through verse 25, we read these words. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Hmm. Beautiful reading. God is our rescuer. He will deliver us through Jesus, this verse tells us. Power to, 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 to deliver us from this confused, sinful defeated state that we find ourselves in, where human willpower and emotional power fail. It goes on to say in Matthew, pardon me, in Romans, I don't know where Matthew came from, but Romans chapter 7, verses 7 through 8, these words. What shall I say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, You shall not covet. 
But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, proceeded in every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. That's kind of how sin works. Points something out, says, hey, don't do that. Our sinful nature says, that's the very thing I want to do. Wow, I don't know if you can relate to this. I certainly can. James 4, verse 17 says it this way. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and does not do it, it is sin for them. There are sinful things that we know we shouldn't do, and we do them anyway. There are good things that we should do, and we don't do those. Sin either way. Spiritual defeat either way. Battling with this law of sin and death versus this law of the Spirit and life. Either way. Our best intentions... They don't measure up. But there's something else at work within us. Blessed intention. You see, this is God has intention for us as well. God has something else in mind for us, the ability to live by His divine nature. Giving our lives to Jesus and being filled with the Spirit means we have power to overcome sin and live the way God intended for us to live. We don't have to depend on our own power. Thanks be to God for that, because our power isn't very good. God condemns sin in the flesh through the sacrifice of Jesus, and we can embrace that. We can find power to continually put away sin through the help of the Holy Spirit. And here are a couple of passages to consider that shed some light on that. The first one is in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, which read as follows. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. See those two laws at work right there? Wow, beautiful stuff. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, watch this, but according to the Spirit. Ah, beautiful stuff. Another verse that we want to read that I think sheds some light here. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. For this reason, I remind you to fan and to flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us, watch this, power, love, and self-discipline. God's divine power brings about power for true change at the deepest of levels. And it does this because there are three deep levels of change that His divine power bring about through the Holy Spirit. And they can bring this power of change even to us. Number one is mind power. Mind power is available to us. A real change at, at, at the deep intellectual and thought process area of, of our brain. God provides wisdom and knowledge and has provided the Scriptures as a guide. And the Holy Spirit certainly assists in this process. James chapter 1 verses 2 through 8 remind us of this. Consider it pure joy. Oh, that's certainly a mental state. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of every kind, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any one of you lacks wisdom, ah, clearly, something that our mind can wrap its fingers around. You should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Again, working on that mind, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is, watch this, double-minded and unstable in all that they do. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17 say it this way, But I ask for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you, watch this, wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. 
All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so, the ser- so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. He's trying to bring about change for us at the deepest level, and he's working on our mindset. He's working at those things that we think about, those things that we believe, those things that we feel at a deep, mindful level. But there's also emotional power that's at work in deep change, and it's available to us as well through the Spirit. In fact, Romans 14 says it expressly in verses 17 through 19, which read as follows. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Look look at all those emotions there. Righteousness, peace, joy. How? In the Spirit, through the Spirit. Because everyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. The very next chapter, Romans 15 and verse 13, reads as follows. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow, watch this, with hope. How? By the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, God's working on that change at a deep level with us in the very things that we we have as it relates to our emotions, our feelings, feelings of peace, feelings of joy, feelings of hope. But there's a third deep level too, and I believe the deepest, and that is in true will power. Not the way we typically think about it, where we will ourselves to do something, but more importantly, the power of following whose will in our life. And true willpower, I believe, is available to us through the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Read as follows. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Holy Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Love this passage because it tells us about those very things that Paul told Timothy. There is that power, that love, and that self-discipline right there. Continuing the reading. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. What a beautiful powerful passage. It screams of the will of God. Not our human will. That will never change us. But when we live by God's will, through the power of the Spirit, then, my friends, true change can come. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. You've done very well. We're almost done. Hang in here. We read these words. Therefore, If any of you have encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, and of one mind. Here's where we embrace, if you will, that will of God. Continuing continuing the reading. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, 
that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed not only your presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill, watch this, His good purpose. Ah, changing our own human will to true willpower, if you will, that will bring about change. And true willpower only comes through living in accordance with God's will, not our own. And I believe it can only be accomplished through the Holy Spirit. So in conclusion, beautiful term, power from the Holy Spirit is available, I believe, to the church as a whole uh, at the body and congregational levels. In fact, a passage that we read in Ephesians chapter 2 says this. Ephesians 2 verses 21 through 22 read this uh, this way. In Him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in Him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. When he's talking about the building here, he's not talking about the church building. He's talking about the church. He's talking about the body. And he's talking about this. Man, the Spirit and God is at work in that. And it's bringing about great power for change. As a group, as a body, as a whole. But there are also references there to the individual working, the individual power of change that is wrought in our life through the Holy Spirit. Another passage, and we read this moments ago, that I think is very, very uh, important to us to, to review one last time. Power from the Holy Spirit is available not only to the church, but, but also, uh, not to the church as a whole, but also to, to individual members. And we read in Ephesians 3, 20 through 21 again, this passage it gives me goosebumps when I read it. Now to him who is able to do, watch this, immeasurably more. Wow. Then all we ask or imagine. I've known church folks who ask for a lot of stuff. I've known church folks who have vivid imaginations. And God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. And how? According to his power that is at work within us. Not just as a group. But as individual children of God, believers, filled with His Spirit, filled with His presence, filled with life to Him, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I think this verse implies that, and certainly other passages that we've looked at have expressly stated that God is working within us through His Spirit to bring about great change. He's working within His church, both at the group level and at the individual level, to bring about these great changes. To change from our will, our human will, to His divine will. Man, what a wonderful thing. So, at the end of the day, the question comes down to this. What will you do with this information? Well, the choice is yours. And you really have a simple choice, the law of sin and death or the law of life in His Son through the Holy Spirit. I want to encourage you, choose wisely. Your life depends on it, not only in this life, but in the life to come that is eternal. May God bless you this week. If we can help you in any way this week, we want to do the best we can to do that. So we're offering yet another one of these unprecedented invitations. A little different than what we're used to. If we can help you in any way, we want to encourage you. Call the church offices at the number listed right there. Or you can email the elders if you have like a prayer request or, or a request to study or, or any of these kinds of things. Or you can also email the church office at the address right there on the bottom of the screen. If we can help you, whether it be putting on Jesus in baptism, having your sins washed away, beginning your new walk with Him, or, or study, or in some other way, then please reach out to us. May God bless you this week. May you find that real change that will sustain you far beyond your best intentions to His blessed intention for you. Thank you so much.
gracious unto you and be gracious. The Lord be gracious, gracious unto you. Amen. In closing, pray with me. Lord, we'd like to thank you for this day that we could come and worship you. Lord, we ask that your, our worship be pleasing to your ear. We ask that you be with our, our brothers and sisters here at this church. We ask that this worship be an encouragement to them, and not only to our, our family here, but our, our family all over the world who are viewing. Lord, we ask that you uh, be with our brothers and sisters, keep them healthy, keep them safe as we go out through this next week. Lord, as we, uh, are we, as we move towards uh, joining together as a family uh, in, uh, here at church, we ask that you give us a willing heart and to, and to do whatever is asked of us to do so we can protect and care for our family. Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for our salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.